so hello everyone salam namaste adab and welcome to today's event with professor jonathan brown of georgetown university uh, the topic of today is, uh, event is south asian islamic thought and uh, i am i have invited a very senior uh, academic uh, academician here in the community dr mozam siddiqui who is quite familiar with professor brown's work as well as the department's work at georgetown uh, so he is going to give you formal introduction of professor brown and of the team so welcome dr mozam siddiqui sir and please thank you start so it gives me a great pleasure to introduce dr jonathan brown who's a professor at the prince al walid bin talal chair of islamic civilization at the school of foreign service at georgetown university and uh, he has been an uh, uh, georgetown has been his alma mater and uh, he was an undergraduate here uh, in uh, i think uh, 2000 to 2004 and since i am i graduated in 2000 my my wife was 2003 or something but i was 2000 yeah and uh, so it so happens that uh, i have lived in washington since uh, 1984 and uh, i was uh, at the university of california berkeley and uh, so even though my field is a uh, comparative linguistics and comparative literature but i have also i mean in the area the same area as dr brown and uh, that's why it gives me great pleasure and i have heard a lot about him and he's such a young and promising scholar already has produced so many books and uh, written so many articles and in order to be a student of civilization and religion you have to know several languages so he knows arabic persian he has also been to india knows urdu and i think uh, you also yeah, a little bit of urdu very very small <laughs> but uh, do you, i think you also know a little bit of turkish i'm sure yeah yeah and uh, so and he has uh, written several books but i'm going to mention only three here canonization of al bukhari and muslim the formation and function of the sunni hadith canon and number 2 hadith muhammad's legacy in the medieval and modern world and number 3 muhammad a very short introduction and uh, professor brown got his phd from one of the premier institutions not only in the united states but uh, throughout the world the university of chicago and uh, the department of islamic studies and civilization at the university of chicago has had many distinguished professors and i can think of a uh, uh, late professor uh, uh, hodgson who wrote a three volume uh, book on uh, the history civilization all aspects of islam in the, the context of world history so he was uh, unfortunately not there when uh, professor brown was attending university of chicago and also i can think of uh, uh, professor fazlur rahman who joined university of chicago in the late 50s uh, because he was in pakistan during the the regime of uh, general ayub khan and he was hounded out from pakistan by the orthodox uh, ulama of pakistan and he has written many books and uh, one of his book which is very famous is uh, islam a very short book and uh, so also so many other distinguished scholars and uh, uh, very briefly speaking about uh, south asia or i should say the indian subcontinent and uh, islam so i'll give you a very brief uh, 
uh, outlines very uh, uh, hallmarks during the uh, you know contact between india and uh, the world of islam so i begin with a famous hadith which is quoted by many scholars uh, prophet muhammad uh, reported to have said i feel cool breeze from india and uh, then uh, the contact with india uh, of the islamic world not only the i mean not the arab world it it, pre, it predates uh, uh, the advent of islam the contact between the gulf states and uh, the malabar coast so we have uh, uh, the first mosque that was built in india dates back to 626 sorry uh, 726 and that mosque is still there and has been continuously used in kerala and then after that let me take you to uh, the contact with uh, the umayyad caliphate muhammad bin qasim the young general uh, conquered sin and multan and uh, after that the other high point is uh, the contact with the medieval world great civilizations greek uh, and then later on alexandria which was also greek and roman and uh, the ancient civilizations iran and uh, turan and uh, sumeria and india so india is uh, known for its science mathematics so the numbering system was taken from india uh, by the arabs and uh, at the darul hikma the house of wisdom that was established by harun rashid and that's where the numbers were used by the arabs and developed uh, the science of uh, mathematics uh, algebra and other sciences and they called it in arabic hindsa which means they are acknowledging the origin of numbers to india whereas uh, the europeans who were uh, who received the numbering system from the arabs they call it the arabic numerals after that we have the contact between the turanians and iranians the invasion of uh, mahmud ghaznavi and then the histories after mahmud ghaznavi is quite well known to you and let me also mention a very famous name abu rehan al biruni who spent 13 years in india and studied sanskrit for you know a lot of years and he wrote an encyclopedic book on india it is literally an encyclopedia called uh, a very long title but uh, in english it is called the book of india in which he talks about history anthropology languages uh, philosophy cultures and all that and after that we have so many other uh, dynasties until we come to the mughal dynasty and uh, uh, since after that you know the history of islam during the mughal period and then the british come and uh, after that you know uh, so i think uh, i i have given you enough background the contact between uh, india and the indian subcontinent and the islamic world so let's uh, uh, give it back to professor jonathan brown um assalamu alaikum everybody uh, uh, i'm uh, really happy to be here and um you know i um in my thanks for inviting me and for showing up uh, i i think a lot of times if i could go back and kind of redo my career i would uh, i would focus on um uh you know south asian history I, i'm going to say indian today india india just because um it's easier than saying south asia and but of course i mean kind of the whole of the subcontinent i'm not uh you know, politically pushing for support of India over the modern nation state of India over some other country. Uh, so to make it that clear. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's just such an interesting, um, such an interesting part of Islamic history. I mean, I'm I'm really interested in uh, sort of India in Islamic history. I confess I'm not super interested in uh, pre-Islamic India. Uh, I mean, it's not I'm not not interested in it, but I'm really interested in kind of South Asia as part of the Islamic world. And I think um, one of the reasons I'm really interested is because you have a situation in which uh, Muslims are a minority, uh, you know, at the most, if you take sort of South Asia as a whole kind of max out at about one quarter of the population, I think. And, um, you know, they, they, they have a lot of different relationships to the people around them, to the, to the context they're in. They, they're, they're traders like on the, the Malabar coast as uh, Professor Zik was saying. They're, uh, they're, they're traders at first, then they're, um, let me remove this. Then they're, uh, um, they're, they're raiders coming from the, from the north, uh, from the Northwest under the, you know, well, first they're kind of conquerors during the, the time of um, uh, Muhammad al-Qasim in Sin, then they're kind of raiders under the, the Ghaznavid to sort of set up camp in, in Afghanistan and later on in, in the Punjab. And then they come and settle as uh, as rulers from uh, and settlers in during the time of the Delhi Sultanate, roughly from you know around 1192 uh, onward. And then they they gradually basically blend in with the the indigenous population and become uh, you know, fully part of, of Indian history, right? So this idea of Muslims as foreigners or as outsiders is, you know, um, it might it might be true at the very beginning in the sense that they're merchants or that they're warriors or something, but they very quickly uh, blend in and create a kind of uh, uh, composite uh, society and composite civilization. And uh, and you, you can see this with the, the various states of you know the kind of successor states of the Delhi Sultanate, and then you of course see it most clearly with the, the Mughals. And uh, I really, if you're interested, I, I recommend reading uh, Richard Eaton's relatively new book called India and the Persianate Age, which is a fascinating, uh, you know, excellent review of, from a great great scholar who knows all the regional languages that are important to know, and who's just a terrific scholar in general. Richard Eaton's um, India in a Persianate in the Persianate Age, and what he shows is that is it the, the kind of the the idea of Persianate culture is a culture that is is a period in Indian history that kind of between the Delhi Sultanate and uh, the kind of the the eighteen thirties and eighteen forties when the the British really start to enforce their authority their cultural and colonial authority. It's a period in which uh, Persian language, Persian language, Persian literature, Persian sensibilities uh, become a medium for everybody in India to communicate and express themselves, whether they're Muslim, whether they're various you know, types of Hindu, whether they're et cetera. So anything you can imagine, you know, Zoroastrian. So a Persianate becomes this kind of religiously neutral language of artist, of art and communication and aesthetics and scholarship uh, that is uh, that flourishes under this in, in, under this period of Muslim Muslim rule in history in, in India, and uh, what he also shows, and I mean this has been shown by other people before, but I think he does a great job of bringing this information together. Is that you know all these Muslim states, you know, from the time of the Delhi call, uh, Delhi Sultanate onward, are they're not um, foreign states, right? They're they're Muslim they're they're Muslims ruling in India as Indian rulers. So the way they show themselves on coins, the way they legitimize themselves, the way they structure their states, the way they structure their alliances. They are, um, they're just, they're Indian rulers like Indian rulers were acting a thousand years before them. And the, the, he, he shows that the, the Mughal empire, especially after the time of Akbar, is really a, in a lot of ways, it's a Rajput rule, they're Rajputs, right? The way they, the, the, even the genetically, I mean, by the time you get to like someone like Shah Jahan or Aurangzeb, and these people are like half or two th or three fourths Rajput. You know, I mean, they're um, the the language the, the language they speak at home when they're you know yelling at their kids and stuff is it's a dialect of essentially North Indian, right? So uh, 
and they create this um, this you know composite art artistic style, composite um, political style, composite uh, court culture, everything, literature, and that's that really fascinating because you you have you know how do you how do you live as Muslims uh, as a my as a minority you know first as a as kind of traders then as rulers then as rulers who are at home in that uh, land it, with its language with its culture and then of course what really interests me is then they they start to have to live as subjects of the British you know first you know maybe they're just accepting their protection or working with them then they're you know maybe a little bit more dependent on them then a little bit more dependent on them and then finally very clearly uh, the, the British are in charge uh, how do you make sense of that as a Muslim um, then the kind of the British start to to maybe uh, be a little bit more forceful about things like uh, missionary activity about um, you know creating a kind of upper class and anglicized anglophone uh, upper class how do muslims make sense of that how do they make sense of modernity in a lot of ways one of the reasons i really really like uh kind of islam in south asia as a subject is because these are the first people who the first muslims who, who come face to face with the challenge of modernity you know the challenge of modernity that is for them also the challenge of the west um so i think that's that's really you know in a, in a lot of ways Islamic thought since 1800 is a repetition or rehashing the discussions that Indian Muslims are having from around 1800, right? So they're the, they're the first people to have these discussions and they're the, they kind of, they create the, all the germs of this, of this discussion. And then kind of everybody else just sort of hashes, rehashes it over and over again. And so that's why I, I really find it fascinating. Um, so I'm also not, but this is not my, expertise. So in some, you know, when uh, I was invited to give this presentation, I said, you know, I don't really know what to talk about. It's not my expertise, but I, I do my best to learn about it. And I take Indian Muslim scholarship very, very, very seriously. And that's not because I'm some kind of, you know, sensitive, charitable person. It's because anybody who has dips even a finger into Indian Islamic scholarship immediately takes it very, very seriously because these people are not jokes. They are no joke whatsoever. I mean, these, the, just as a, as a brief uh, statement, I mean, a uh, brief introduction, right? The, if you want to find the best writings on Hadith, Hadith commentary, uh, Hanafi law, um, uh, some of the best writings on Islamic theology from the, the 1800s until the, the 20 through the 20th century until today uh you're talking about uh, indian scholars without just without a doubt in terms of volume in terms of quality um if you you know I, I i remember you know i wrote this book on islam and slavery and i i looked at all the different hadith commentaries on the, the hadiths involved and you know it's interesting and you see the same ideas coming up over and over again and then I read uh, Mufti Taki Osmani's Takmil uh, al Mulhim on Sahih Muslim. And he just took everything to the next level. I mean, and you see this over and over again with Mufti Taki Osmani uh, with his writing is that he'll always take the conversation to another level of quality and, and comprehensiveness. And, and, you know, so he's, you're talking about somebody who's um, not summarizing the, the the golden ages of the past, you're talking about somebody who's participating in that tradition and moving it forward and building on it in a way that's completely organically a continuation of that, of that, of that past. And that's someone who's alive today, right? Uh, so, you know, you can imagine the, the figures like, you know, Shamsuddin Adhim Abadi, Muhammad Zakaria Kandahlawi, um, uh, you know, Zafar Ahmad Osmani, uh, um, uh, Allahumma say to Muhammad, uh, Ashraf Ali Tanvi, uh, Anwar Shah Kashmiri, right? I mean, these figures are, um, you know, immense scholars and they're incredible scholars, incredible. So I, I, this is a the book I've been reading and I got this in, in the Darat al Ma'arif al Uthmaniya in Hyderabad. I got to, to my, one of my favorite intellectual pilgrimages was to go to actually the, 
the Da'arat al-Ma'arif al-Uthmaniya at Osmania University in Hyderabad and visit that place where so many great um, Islamic texts were edited and published for the first time. And uh, I bought a lot of books there, of course, and I got them, remember I got them bound in the Chandi Chok district in Delhi with a very nice uh, little Muslim bookbinder shop. And I went and had meals with them and they're a wonderful family. Um, and so this is, this is the Nuzhat uh, al-Khawatir of Abdul Hay al-Hassani of, of Nadwa. And it's a, you know, early mid 20th century Muslim scholar who does a history of all the ulama and kind of leading figures, political, literary, intellectual figures of, of Islam in South Asia. And uh, up till kind of, I think the early 20th century. And if, so if you, if you look here, you can see, sorry for my um, horrible handwriting, but so this is actually by Hijri century. And this is really interesting because you can kind of see the volume of Muslim intellectual activity. So, okay, so the volume seven at the top is essentially, this is rough, but basically the 1800s to into the little 1900s of the, of the common era, right? So you can think of the, the time of scholar, the Shah, uh, Shah Abdul Aziz Dehlawi died 1825. You think of, you know, Fadlallah al Adhim Abadi, uh, sorry, al Khair uh, Abadi and Shah, Shah Ismail al Shaheed and um, uh, the kind of founders of Deoband and, uh, and Ferengi Mahal in the, in the top volume. Then you go below that, you're basically into the 1700s of the common era. So you, you have, sorry, I'm holding this up. It's sort of unstable, but I'll do my best. The 1700s, which is, you know, uh, of course, Shah Wali Allah, Dehlawi, and uh, the, the figures of um, revival and reform in India, 1700s. You go down to volume five, which is roughly the 1600s. You can think of figures like uh, Abdul Haqqa Dehlawi, who died, I think, in uh, 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 1642 or 1052 Hijri, around 1642 of the Common Era. And then below that is the 1500s, volume four. And you can see it's these are uh, voluminous. And then below that, volume three is into the 1500s. And you can see there's a real kind of drop in volume. Oh, wait, so let me think here. No, no, no. So, okay, I'm sorry. So volume four would be the 1500s. Volume five is the 1600s. Volume six is the 1700s. Volume eight is the 1800s, right? So volume four in the 1500s, you, still, you see it's still pretty high volume, but then you get into volume three in the 1400s, common era, then you start re really see a, a, you know, we're going back in time, right? So things are kind of going, uh, getting smaller and smaller, kind of the, uh, the the beginning of the tree as it starts to blossom. And then uh, below, before that into the, the 1300s and before that into the 1200s. And before that, it's kind of not really a, a, a thing, right? So, but you see, it's really in the 1500s that you have the explosion of intellectual activity. And I, a lot of that is, I think, because of the, um, the kind of blossoming of the, of the Mughal of the Mughal state, but uh, I think this is really interesting because you just see the sheer um, volume of, of Muslim intellectual activity. Now, what, what's really interesting is for me is, uh, and, and I say this in in no way to detract from the the sort of piety or sincerity or value of any of any part of the Muslim world. But, and I, I also say this as a huge fan of, of kind of Islam in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. But if you look at kind of compare Islamic scholarship in India and Islamic scholarship in Sub-Saharan Africa, like let's say the kind of West African world of Timbuktu and Mali, they're in a lot of ways, uh, their histories are, are parallel in the sense that you get, you know, early trade contact, um, you get sort of the beginning of conversion of some rulers and courts in Sub-Saharan Africa in the early 10 hundreds. Um, you get kind of the rise of, of, of Muslims, very wealthy Muslim states in the 1200s, 1300s, um, 1400s, 1500s, like the great big empires like Mali and, uh, and Songhai. And uh, the, you know, when famous uh, pilgrimage of King Mansa Musa from 
uh, from Mali when he goes in the 1300s to do his Hajj, and uh, he some a Muslim scholar from the Hejaz actually goes back to Mali with him, and he's really stunned by the quality of of Maliki jurists. Like he says, you know, the scholars here really know what they're doing. These aren't some, you know, these aren't kind of country bumpkins who don't know anything. He's really impressed with the the scholarship there. So. Um, the, the kind of quality of Islamic scholarship in Sub-Saharan Africa is very high from an early period um, in terms of Maliki law. In ter and one thing they write a lot of is praise of the Prophet, just endless volumes of praising the Prophet. It's an incredible devotion. But what's really interesting is they don't, I, and I, I do not think there is a single commentary on Hadith written in Africa, in sort of West Africa, South of the Sahara. As far as I know, there's a, some written in like Ethiopia, Somalia region, but that, that's it, it's a, a very different like you compare that to South Asia, where I mean, you get to the point in the 1700s and 1800s where any scholar worth his salt can write a commentary on Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim, just as they, it's like, you know, you have to do it. It's like, uh, you know, something you have to have on your resume. So the very, the, and what's really interesting is there are a few books from, by West African Muslim scholars that are used in the rest of the Muslim world, a very small number. If you look at the number of books that are, that are considered authoritative references by Indian scholars that are used throughout the Muslim world, it's a large number, a large number, right? So, I mean, and, First of all, if you, I mean, again, I'm not, I am not in any way saying that sort of the Arab world is the standard by which things are measured, but I'm just talking about, let's look at sort of the spread. You know, we'll, we'll look at the Arab world or the Ottoman world. There's just examples of things spreading to other places. If you go to a bookstore in Cairo or in Istanbul, either this year or a hundred years ago, you'll find, you know, books like, uh, uh, Allah Muhammad um, Al Mubarak Furi's or Mubarak Puri's commentary on uh, the collection of Tirmidhi. You'll see uh, Zakaria Kandahlawi's commentary on the Muatta of Malik. You'll see um, some of the earliest books printed in Islamic theology and a printed press are include uh, Abdul Hakim Asi Al Kuti, the famous uh, 17th century uh, Indian scholar Asi Al Kuti's commentary on the Aqid of Nasafi, right? You'll see, um, Allahumma says to Muhammad, you'll see uh, the Masharaq al-Anwar of Sahrani. Sahrani died in 1252, one of the earliest uh, Muslim scholars from India who travels to Baghdad and he does a very authoritative uh, copy of Sahih Bukhari. He writes his own Hadith collection uh, called the uh, Masharaq al-Anwar, which is very popular um, uh, throughout uh, the Muslim world. So um, I'm just trying to think of other examples. Uh, I'm say to Muhammad. Um, oh, of course, the Fatawa al Hindia, right? The Fatawa, Fatawa al Alamgiri, that, that's commissioned by the Emperor Aurangzeb in the, six, in the late 1600s. This book is, I mean, it's called the Fatawa al Hindia, the Indian Fatwa. I mean, this is a book that is, um, you know, cited and and by by Hanafi scholars in the Ottoman world. You know, an, an incredible book to this day, an incredible resource of, for uh, understanding the, Han the Hanafi school of law. And I could go on and on, uh, on and on with uh, about works by, written by Indian scholars that are really authoritative and widespread around the Islamic world. Okay. Um, so here's an interesting question. Uh, why is this? Uh, why is there such a kind of intense and voluminous production of Muslim scholarship in, in South Asia, especially from essentially the 1400s onward. And I would say that from my, 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 my theory, I mean, probably other people have already talked about this, but I'm not a specialist, I'm just doing my best, right? I think is there's a huge number of very powerful and wealthy Muslim states that emerge after the Delhi Sultanate. So the Delhi Sultanate is very interesting, right? As I said, it kind of emerges around 1200 in Delhi. And 
by the time you get to, there's a, a series of, of different dynasties in the Delhi Sultanate. As you know, you can all go read about that if you don't already know about it. But by the time it kind of starts to fall apart in the, the mid 1300s, late 1300s, and then of course, uh, Tamerlane comes in the late 1300s and sacks Delhi, and that's a very traumatic event. Uh, but really, in a lot of ways, the, the, the scene of Muslim South Asia is already established. So the, the Delhi Sultanate expands significantly southward into the Deccan Plateau. So they, it's not like the, when, when you look at sort of the Mughal conquest of India does not go that much farther beyond what the Delhi, Sultan, the Delhi Sultanate had conquered. And when T Tamerlane comes and sacks uh, uh, Delhi, the successor states to the, um, to the Delhi Sultanate are really impressive states, right? You have the, the uh, uh, Qutb Shahi dynasty in Golconda, the Nizam Shahis, I think in, um, in Hyderabad, you have the, um, uh, the Adil Shahis in um, Bijapur, you have the Ahmed Nagar, you have the Bahmanis in Dawladabad, and you have this the rise of Gujarat, especially in the, in the 1400s. And what's interesting is the, although Tamerlane comes and causes political chaos and it's very traumatic in terms of the number of lives lost, the 1400s in India is actually a time of incredible cultural and intellectual efflorescence. So Tamerlane's legacy is, I mean, not that your history is made by people like Tamerlane alone, right? But if you think about the 1400s as sort of the aftermath of Tamerlane, it's a time of incredible productivity and growth. And, uh, and that's really interesting, right? So, and then when the, the, the Mughals come to power, a lot of their time through the 1600s is just spent conquering and defeating these other Muslim states to their south, as well as of course, group, uh, uh, states like the Rajputs. So th that's why I think when you, you look at in, in, in Islam in India in the 1400s onward, you're, you're looking at a number of really powerful, rich, committed Muslim states that are very interested in patronizing Muslim scholarship. And you can see just the, the, the extent to which uh, places like Daulatabad under the, the Bahmanis or uh, Bijapur or Ahmed Nagar or Golconda, or Golconda they st in the 1400s, just, I mean, creating madrasas. Every time a big scholar comes, let's build this guy a madrasa, right? Uh, after the Sta Tamerlane's invasion, Jaunpur becomes a, a really important center in uh, what's now, I think it would be uh, Bihar, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Jaunpur becomes a major center. Eastern UP. Oh, Eastern UP, okay, thanks. So all, you know, a lot of scholars who flee Delhi on the t uh, when Tamerlane invades, go to Jaunpur, where they are received under the Shalki dynasty, supported, given medrasas are built to them, built for them. I mean, I'll say this, it's, it's, it's not unique. This is not unique in Islamic history by any stretch, but Muslim rulers in India really honored the ulama. They really honored them and they patronized them and they supported them. And so you have immense, and of course, not just ulama of law and, but of course, they love Sufism. You know, they love Sufism and you all know this, right? So, you know, the, the, the extent to which they honored and followed uh, Sufi saints. So you had, whereas in a place like West Africa, you have, a, I think a couple of centers that are very wealthy like Timbuktu um, or, or Gao. In South Asia, you have, you know, half a dozen, maybe a dozen such places that are just poor. And this is an, another thing which you, you realize is the extent to which South Asia was the land of, uh, it was the, you know, how do I say this? It was like um, you know, the land of milk and honey or something. It was a land, it was like El Dorado, you know? It was for Muslim scholars, and you see this in the 1400s and 1500s, it was a place you would go and really make it big as a Muslim scholar. And what you start seeing is, especially in the 1400s, scholars from Baghdad, from Aleppo, from Cairo, from the Hejaz, from Yemen, moving to India, to, to places like Gujarat, to places like Daulatabad, uh, to places like Jaunpur, to, uh, and, and, and becoming extremely wealthy and, and kind of uh, secure 
I mean, this is where they go to, you know, get their tenure track job, you know? And so you can see in the, 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 the kind of the streams of influence on Indian Islam, there is Yemen and the Hejaz to Gujarat, especially in the, and after the, the Safavids conquer Iran in, after 1501, there's an exodus because the Safavids forcibly convert Iran to Shiism. And so a lot of um, Sunni ulama flee Safavid lands. Some of them go through Central Asia, Samarkand, Bukhara, right, Herat into India. Some of them come through the Persian Gulf to Gujarat. And uh, there's a huge influx. So you have the, 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 the legacy of Mamluk scholarship, Mamluk era scholarship from Egypt and the Hejaz going through Gujarat. You have the Central Asian scholarship of um, uh, Sharif al Jurjani, Saad al Taftazani in the late 1300s coming, their students are coming into India through Central Asia, right down to the south. And so you have kind of Hanafism, Hanafi school of law, Maturidi and Ashri school of theology coming from the north. You have Shafi school of law coming from the kind of Indian Ocean direction and finding homes in all these new Muslim states, which is, I, I think, and you can see like, as you go through the, as you read through the Nuzhat al-Khawatir, you see the names change of where scholars go, where are the, the scholarly centers. You know, uh, of course, Delhi is important. Then Jonpur becomes really important. Uh, in the 1400s, uh, Dawlatabad and Malwa under the Bahmanis, Bijapur, Ahmednagar, Gujarat, a place called Sambal, especially uh, during the, the Mughal period, the areas around Delhi become very important. I think it's called the Dawab. How do you say this in Urdu? Yes. Anybody know what? Yes, Dawab. Dawab, yeah. So Dawab. places like uh, Bilgram, um, uh, Sambal, uh, later... Um, uh, Western UP. Western UP. Yeah, exactly. Other Then later, uh, Kandla, uh, Deoband, right? So these places become very important uh, as as Delhi becomes a center of, of uh, power, right? Okay. Now, um, all right. Yeah, uh, I think I covered that. Uh, I think I covered this. Okay. And what, what's also very interesting is you see the, from the 1400s onward, a really extensive and strong connection of Indian ulama and the Hejaz. Of course, th this is partially through doing the Hajj, right? So they, uh, it's not like Indian ulama are the only Muslims in the world to do Hajj. Of course, a lot of people do Hajj, but they seem to do it in a lot larger number. And I think it was, I think it was arguably easier to do. This is just my theory off the top of my head, uh, because you could, you, you know, you basically go to Gujarat, and then you get on a boat and you go to Mecca. I mean, and that trade route, as was mentioned, you know, in the introduction. It's, it's really from around the, the you know, the, the, the time of Christ. I mean, you're talking about the kind of Hellenistic period when uh, Greek navigators figure out that they can just go straight, across. they don't have to go along the land, they can just go straight across from the Babylon, Mandab and end up in India. And they can use the monsoon winds to do this. So this is a well, um, well-traveled route. And what you see is that in a lot of ways, uh, the Hejaz becomes in some ways a, um, a location of Indian Muslim scholarship. In the 1400s, you have figures like uh, okay. Muhammad bin, ah bin Ahmed uh, Nahrawali from, I guess the place is Nahrawala in Gujarat. Does anyone know that place? Nahwa Nahwala, yeah. yeah. Uh, he dies in about, about 1600 of the common era, or maybe 1590 of the, common, uh, 1590 of the common era. So he and his father both go to the Hejaz and they become such establishments that there's actually to this day one of the, the doors I think of the mosque in Mecca is actually called the, the Bab of Nahawala if I'm not mistaken uh, but I have to check that I, it's a, I need to check that but I mean my so they be uh, Ibn Hajar Haitami who's a huge Shafi scholar originally from Egypt he settles in Mecca huge influential Shafi scholar in Egypt he dies in about 1567 the common era he is he his job his salary is paid in a madrasa that is founded and funded by Sultan Mahmud of Gujarat. Right? So you, there's this um, 
symbiotic, you know, relationship between the Hejaz and especially the, the Gujarat, but not just Gujarat, right? Indian, Indian scholars do, from throughout India will travel there. And what, what's really interesting is from the 1400s, 1500s onward, this constant uh, pattern of Muslim, of Indian scholars going and studying in the Hejaz. And what's interesting, that, um, and I think this is, it certainly explains their expertise in Hadith, is that they bring the intensive tradition of Hadith scholarship from the Hejaz to India in the 1500s, but really especially in the 1600s with Abdul Haqq al-Dihlawi, and then in the 1700s with uh, Shah Wali Allah and his tradition, right? They, this, um, so India, if India becomes the place where Hadith are studied uh, in, in, a, in, in essence after the 1700s, because of this, it, it kind of inherits the, 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 this, this strong, maybe, I don't know, no one really has ever explained how this happened, but somehow Hejaz in the 1500s becomes this dyna dynamic place for the study of, uh, of Hadith. Um, all right, uh, and by the way, what, what's really interesting, uh, I think I talked about this already. Yeah, 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 sorry, I just want, want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, so what's really interesting is uh, not just the way in which India kind of is heir to this Hijazi study of Hadith, but also has this element of revival and reform, even from an early period. Now, um, in terms of history of Islamic thought, people usually use the term revival and reform for the 1700s. So the movements like Shah Wali Allah in India, Sanani in Yemen, Sokoto Caliphate in what's now Northern Nigeria, uh, the Wahhabi movement in, in Central Arabia. So these movements in the 1700s are talked about as a period of revival and reform in, uh, in Islamic thought and in the Islamic world. But it, a lot of these trends are actually present in India actually before, even in the, the 1500s, even in the 1500s, which is very interesting. And it clearly comes from the Hejaz. It clearly comes from the Hejaz. Uh, just to give you an example, and I, I think he, he's also a, a great example because you can kind of, just like people talk about kind of like Team Aurangzeb or Team Dara Shako, like which side are you on? You can see those two sort of teams back into the 1500s already, right? Sort of uh, Team, um, let's just sort of, let's call it more, maybe a more accretionist, or more um, interested in affirming dialogue with Indian tradition versus a more, let's say like orthodox, uh, a stringent uh, approach to Islamic law and practice. You can see this uh, in the 1500s. One of my students is doing um, his paper on this and I hope he, he publishes it. There's a figure called Abdel Nebi al Gangohi, who is uh, essentially, um, a contemporary with Akbar because he's Akbar's tutor. And then he he serves as the Sadr, like the main kind of Sheikh al-Islam in the, the Mughal court for many years until eventually he falls out of favor with Akbar and he he uh, is exiled. But what's very interesting about Abdel Nabi Gangohi is he he wrote a book called uh, Sunan, Sunan al-Huda fi Mutabi'at al-Mustafa. So the, the Sunan, the Sunnah of guidance in following the, the chosen one, the Prophet Muhammad. And he, he wrote it in Arabic. And I don't think it's been published, but there's a we, we found a manuscript of it. And it's a very interesting book. It's essentially a, a book of the fiqh of ibadah of different worship, you know, fasting, praying, hajj, things like that. And that's done uh, with reference to hadith. Now that's not unusual. Uh, this is not, he's not the first person to do this. But what's really interesting is the way that he talks about the Hejaz in his understanding of Islam. And repeatedly in the book, he criticizes various practices in India that he sees as bid'ah, as uh, you know, unacceptable heresy. And his reference for that is the practice of the Hejaz and the scholars of the Hejaz. So it's really interesting that he's, so uh, one of the things he talks about, he says that um, 
for example, let's say that the, the khatib leaning on a cane, on a wooden cane, is, it's sunnah, and how do we know this? This is the practice of the ulama of the Haramain of Mecca and Medina. He says the turakas, and you, you all can tell me if this is actually something that's done in India, I don't know. Uh, turakas prayed at night where you read Ayat al-Kursi. Is this, does anyone do this? Has anyone ever heard of this? Okay, maybe uh, the Nebi got his way here. He says, this has no basis in any hadiths from the prophet and the Arabs don't do it. So I know this is, I don't want anyone to get upset here, but he's saying, <laughs> he's saying basically the Arabs are the, are, should be our reference point. He says, uh, Juma is fard. So Juma, and, and this is, and again, maybe someone can tell me about this. I should probably have looked this up before I talk to you, but there's a debate about whether or not, especially in the Hanafi school, whether or not Juma is really required. Um, because the, the, it, 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 there's some debate about whether it can happen with like a non, um, non unjust leader or a kind of a non, non legitimate Muslim ruler. He says Juma is far, this requirement until the day of judgment. And it doesn't matter if the ruler is just or not just. And the way we know this, the way we know this is the ulama of the Haramain, they they do not pray Duhar on Friday, right? They pray Juma and that's it. They don't pray Juma and then pray Duhar in case the Juma wasn't valid. Um and then this is really interesting. He says, any practice that's allowed, so it's mubah, it's allowed. But the juhal, the, the kind of ignorant people, they start to think that it's required or, or it's, it's part of the sunnah, it becomes prohibited. And by the way, this, this is um, a kind of foreshadowing the debate over the maulid, the kind of Dale Bundy versus Borelli debate over the maulid, where the Dale Bundy say, um, there's nothing wrong with honoring the prophet, of course, and his birthday. But if people start getting to the point where they think this is something you have to do, this is part of Islamic practice, then you ban it because you don't want people to get that this is this sort of um, slippery slope into uh, altering what is actually required versus not required. Versus the Baralbis who say, look, if there's nothing wrong with doing it, and if it's a good thing to do, then people should do it. But you see here with Abdul Nabi Gangohi in the 1500s, already this idea of we need to, this thing is because, the fact people start thinking it's required or good or part of the sunnah, that is a reason to prohibit it. All right. Um, and I could go into other examples, but I won't of uh, figures in the 1500s and 1600s in India who start to do things like uh, one figure, Allah says Muhammad is um, Abdul Salam al, al, al Diwi in the 1600s, who would break with the main ruling of the Hanafi school if he felt that that ruling did not follow the usul of the Hanafi school. So this is interesting. He's getting to the point of being what's called a mujtahid in the madhab. He doesn't go by what the kind of established rule of the madhab is if he feels like that rule is not true to the madhab's own principles. Then in the next century, the 1700s, of course, you get figures like Shah Wali Allah Dehlawi and others who are willing to even break with, uh, go outside the Hanafi Medheb, uh, break with every Medheb and consider themselves to be mujtahids who can um, move between Medhebs based on following hadiths. Okay. Um, I don't know how much longer I'm supposed to talk for, I forgot. Well, you can continue for another 10 minutes. Okay. Um, now, it's... Uh, uh, it's interesting to compare that uh, sort of, we'll call it, you know, more, it's not just orthodox, right? It's, it's because it's, you know, being a, being a Hanafi, someone like Abdul Haqqa Dehlawi in the, in the 1600s, he says very clearly in some of his books, you know, you follow the Medheb, you follow one of the four Medhebs and that's what you do. You don't question that, you don't, um, you know, this is how, how you, how, you how, how to be a rightly guided Muslim, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with just being a regular good old fashioned Hanafi, Maturidi, Naqshbandi, Sufi or something like that. That's perfectly fine. But 
someone like Abdel Nabi Gungohi is uh, even pushing further than that. He's saying that, you know, we need to always be examining our practice and comparing it to the Sunnah of the Prophet. For him, that's best understood through the practice of the, the ulama of, the, of Mecca and Medina. Now, on the other hand, you have this more, I don't want to call it sync syncretic, right? Because I don't think that someone like Dara Shuko or uh, Chishti Sufi scholars in India are somehow heretical. I don't think that they don't care about Islam or that they are interested in some kind of hybrid, you know, watered down version of Islam that's mixed with Hinduism or that's, you know, I think that they're very committed Muslims, but they're, they're, they're really interested and they're willing to think about elements of the Indian religious traditions that are aiming at the same point or aiming at the same objective as uh, the mystical traditions of Islam. And this is why when people talk about, you know, Dawa Shikoh as, you know, or, or as appears like um, uh, Mirza Mazhar Jana Janan and people like that in, in Delhi in the 1700s, that they're somehow, um, you know, accept Indian religion or accept Hinduism. I think that's inaccurate. They accept certain types of Hinduism. They accept certain strains within Hinduism. They accept the uh, monotheistic mystical strain that talks about, you know, seeking union with the divine and the one, right? That, that they, they see that as the same conversation that Muslims, that the Sufi tradition in Islam has, especially the kind of Ibn Arabi tradition. But that doesn't mean that they that they are that they think that it's um, you know makes perfect sense to worship an idol or to have a temple that has you know statues of this that and the other right so they they're not it's not about affirming Hinduism as a family of religions it's about them being interested in a specific strain within Hinduism the kind of mon, uh, monotheistic element non dualistic uh, monotheism so. Uh, I think in, in, in Aditya Vedante, I think is the term in uh, Hindu tradition. Uh, you see this with uh, figures like Dara Shuko when he commissions the 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 something called Mutak al Abhur, the meeting of the of the seas, the confluence of the seas, where he looks at the kind of Hindu mystic tradition, uh, monotheistic mystic tradition, and the Islamic mystical tradition, and sort of shows. Uh, comparison and uh, similarities in their concepts and vocabulary. And then with his Sir al-Asrar, the Secrets of Secrets, which is a, trans a translation and commentary on the, uh, the Upanishads, which is, it's very interesting. One, one scholar, uh, I, I recommend reading a book on this. Uh, it's called this, The Emperor Who Never Was by Supriya Gandhi. It's a very good book. I, I, it's very readable and, and informative, informative about, uh, and uh, she, she talks about it as, in some ways, this, um, the Sira Suar is like a, it's like a commentary on the Quran from the perspective of the Upanishads or a commentary on the Upanishads through the Quran. So it's a really interesting text. Uh, but it, again, this is not, um, the Upanishads are not representative of the entirety of Indian religious tradition, right? Uh, it's a very specific element of it or very specific strain of it. There's, but what I found really interesting is a way that some Muslim scholars from this more comparative tradition uh, try to reconcile the kind of Abrahamic sacred history, the Abrahamic understanding of history and creation with the uh, Indic one. Um, so one scholar, Abdurrahman Chishti, dies in 1638. He incorporates Indian sacred history into Islamic an Islamic sacred historical timeline. And what he, he does is through talking about sort of uh, Indian sages and avatars are like prophets sent to the jinn, right? So uh, India before was populated by humans, it's populated by jinn. And so he, a lot of the drama that takes place in kind of the, the Indian historical pre-time is actually a drama, not with humans, but with jinn and like sort of prophets sent to jinn, which is really interesting. Um, so that's, I think, a, a really um, creative way for Muslim scholars to try and reconcile different 
timelines, sort of cosmological timelines, um, which I think was was important work to do. Um, um, let me see if there's anything I'm leaving out. No, I think that's it. Yeah, I guess that's, uh, I mean, there's so much more to talk about, but uh, those were the points I had to discuss today. So I'm happy to, I guess, you know, yeah. your comments. Yeah. I don't know how many questions I'll be able to answer, but maybe I'd love to hear your opinions. Well, thank you very much. It was very informative and very enlightening. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a big crowd, so I'm sure there won't be much, many questions. But uh, Faisal? See. Um, Mr. Faisal Beg will moderate the. No, Rafat Beg is still here. Agar, uh... Oh, I think he just left. No, he's oh. going to leave soon. Yeah, he, he told me. So you just uh, entertain the questions. I'm sure. I, I, I have. Handle. I have a question. Yes. Gigi, go ahead. Actually, uh, before that, I would like to mention just a few things. So, Shibli Nomani, you know, the great uh, scholar, and uh, he has written so much on different aspects of uh, Islamic thought, and also a very distinguished professor from uh, Aligarh Muslim University, uh, Professor Abdul Aziz Maimani, who was the father of uh, uh, my very dear friend, uh, Muhammad Umar Maimani. Uh, most of, many of you are familiar with him. So I thought that I should mention these two names. And uh, also there was, during the British period, uh, uh, some Muslim scholars uh, preferred not to live in India, so they migrated to uh, Makkah, especially. And uh, Abul Kalam Azad's father was one of them, so that's why Abul Kalam Azad was born in Makkah. And Haji Imzadullah of the Deoband School, and those. Mm -hmm. So I think. A very fascinating, extremely fascinating lecture, and the the breadth of his uh, uh, professor uh, Jonathan Brown's uh, knowledge was amazing, and to know all these things, dates and all that. So I just wanted to commend him, and uh, we have so many things in common, and uh, we can maybe meet sometime since I live in. I would love to. Right. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam. Uh, those who want to ask questions, they can either uh, put their name in the chat box or raise your digital hand. I see uh, Haris Azmi already has asked for. So, Haris, go ahead and uh, ask a question, please. Well, thank you so much. It was very informative and very extensive coverage uh, and, you know, very, very enlightening. My question is very specific, and I just wanted to know. Um, what can you share about the Emperor Aurangzeb? Because he is uh, one of those characters that is very much vilified in the modern Indian history. And uh, anything that you can share that you know, throws light on his character or personality would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I recommend reading the, uh, the relatively new book on him by Audrey Trushk. Um, her last name is kind of hard to spell. I think it's T R U. S C H K E. Uh, it's, it's called Aurangzeb. It's a very good book. It's, it's relatively short and, and accessible. Uh, it's uh, and I think that you know the the way in which uh, South Asian history is is politicized has been politicized is it's very unfortunate because it's it's just designed to. Um, uh, it's sort of uh, self-defeating and it's designed to make make kind of a healthy view of the world around you impossible in, in a lot of ways. I think going back to the British, so the, the British, uh, in order to kind of justify their presence, they portrayed, you know, they said Indian history is basically this kind of, the ancient India was this land of wisdom on the sort of Sanskritic, Sanskritic wisdom. And then, the sort of the dark ages of Muslim rule, 
And now we British are here to kind of return you to enlightenment and things like that. Uh, so the British had a vested interest in portraying um, the period of kind of Persianate age that, that, that Richard Eaton talks about as being one of darkness and kind of violence and intolerance. Uh, when of course it was really under the, you know, the, the British that these lines, the kind of communal lines are solidified uh, even in the, the 19th and even the 20th century, right? Um, and and are, are exploited as a divide and conquer, um, as a divide and conquer um, method. So, uh, and, and in, that, uh, in that narrative, uh, Aurangzeb is the, you know, this sort of, the, the, he, he screws up because he's too Muslim, right? He, the, the way that you are successful in India is when you're not really Muslim. Right? So in order to be successful Muslim in India, you have to be not really Muslim. That's the kind of me the message that the Aurangzeb lesson is supposed to give in the modern kind of Indian narrative. And if you take it in the kind of BJP Indian nationalist narrative, then Aurangzeb is just another one of the worst, these, these horrible Muslim rulers who destroy temples and, and treat Hindus badly, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just not, that's not an accurate understanding of Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb was a, 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 an Indian ruler. So he's, he's not, he's Muslim, but he's Indian, right? So he has some temples destroyed. He builds some temples. He takes away land from some temples. He endows some temples. Um, and Richard Eaton has talked about this extensively as so does Audrey Chuch, which is that Muslim rulers and Hindu rulers in Indian history uh, doing things like destroying temples or, or supporting them was political, were political actions. Right? If you, someone's your friend, you support their temple. If someone's your enemy, you destroy their temple. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if they're Hindu or Muslim, right? Um, uh, then the, the issue of, you know, to what extent was he, uh, did he kind of turn away from the, the, the tolerant uh, legacy of Akbar and Shah Jahan? Um, you know, I don't think that's really, you know, he, during the time of Aurangzeb, he spent most of his career campaigning in the Deccan, right? Uh, trying to expand mobile rule. And that arguably his biggest mistake was doing that and not kind of tending to the core areas of the Mughal empire and not making sure that his sons were gonna be effective rulers after him. But, you know, by, by his time, a lot of the, uh, things like the, the kind of burgeoning Mar Maratha power, uh, these groups had already started to rebel against uh, the Mughals. So there wasn't like, in you know, you know, he imposed the jizya and stuff. Yeah, maybe that, that was a, a bad decision, but for, from his, I think his calculation, this was going to make some people happy and the people that was gonna upset were already upset at him, right? So he didn't really, I think it was sort of, Maybe it was a bad decision, but I don't think it was a kind of one that was made out of uh, ir irrational fanaticism. I think it was a, a calculation. And this is the same kind of decision that any ruler in South Asia would be presented with. And he was acting like a South Asian ruler. And, and Richard Eaton and, and talks about this in his book, um, in uh, it's India and the Persian Age, which is a great example. He goes back to the, to the uh, to the 10 hundreds and he shows how differently Indian, you know, we think historically about let's say Mahmoud Ghazna's invasion of India versus invasions of some parts of the Deccan into other parts of like uh, around um, kind of Bengal, right? So there's, why is it that one of them is from the outside and one of them is the inside? Like it only makes sense if you already have this idea that there's this historical thing called India that has boundaries and borders. But the fact of the matter is, you know, people are fighting against each other and conquering each other and destroying this and supporting that. Um, and it's only if we decide that kind of being Muslim or not, is, or make somebody Indian or not, that those lines start taking shape around, you know, what is India and what isn't. So I think that that's uh, an important thing to keep in mind. And the, these, uh, histories of orangs, and I mean, it's shocking. I, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm taking a long time to ask yeah. you this question. Yeah, can but I would just say, yeah, I would just say it's shocking when you look at the, I can't believe some of the stuff I read by Indian scholars, like 
uh, kind of Hindu Indian scholars on Islamic, uh, Middle East, Middle, Middle, the history of the Middle Ages, India. The stuff they write is, if I if I wrote that about somebody, I would be fired. I mean, it would be so horrifically intolerant the way they talk. I mean, some things like you know, it's not conceivable that anybody would actually convert to Islam out of free will. Like I've literally seen that written by in academic publications by Indian scholars. Like, I mean, who is intolerant here? I don't know what what to say except that 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 that. That way of telling history is backward. I would never accept it. Right. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Sayed Hussain, you're next. Uh, you mentioned the Hijaz as the center of uh, learning a lot. Uh, what about the Jame al Hazar? That has any influence on uh, Indian scholars? And the second question is another. Uh, Alim Al Ghazali also is really fine. He has any influence in India? Al Ghazali? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean he does. Uh, you know, the the, the 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 canon of the, I'd say that other people have a lot more. If you're sort of the Sufi tradition, so Ghazali as a as a jurist was Shafi. Um, which means he's going to have limited. I mean, his his work had already been superseded in the Shafi school. As a theologian, he's you know Ashari. His work had already been superseded by other later scholars. As a Sufi, you know, um, his probably his most influential book is the Hiya al uh, which does get uh, discussed. And um, I remember there's one uh, scholar who brings a copy of it. I think even in like part of it's in Ghazali's own hand. To India in the 1500s, and that's really treasured. But there, I'd say, his, the, if you look in, in terms of India in the, the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, the scholars from the Sufi tradition who are really uh, paid attention to a lot more, uh, Suhrawardi, who died, I think, 1245 um, in Iraq, uh, Rumi, especially in the 1600s and 1700s. Muslim scholars love writing commentaries on Rumi, Masnavi. Um, of course, Ibn Arabi is very influential. So uh, uh, Ghazali, it's not that he's not important, it's just that he's, in a lot of ways, his work had been superseded by people like Ibn Arabi and Rumi and, uh, and later figures. All right, thank you. Uh, there was a question from Sayyid Hassan, but I think he has left, so I'm gonna skip that. Uh, next one is Iram Gul, you have a couple of questions. You wanna go ahead? And after that will be Dr. Abdul Jabbar and Monoji Chatterjee. Hiram Gul. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to ask uh, uh, why scholars in India wrote commentaries of books of Hadith, whether it was needed or some other reason was there. And Professor Brown yeah. request to keep it short, please. Yeah. Um... You know, I don't. I don't know why they, they did. I think that's that's a really that's a really good question. Uh, because other other people in the Muslim world didn't, from the same time, did not do that. Um, and it's not that they were any more or less Muslim. I think they just got. They really got. I don't know. I think they just this this genre of of writing became really valued and, and important and people, it was their way of honoring the prophet, I think. That's one theory is just, that was their way of honoring the prophet. All right, thank you. Uh, Abdul Jabbar. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, a great presentation. Uh, uh, I, I didn't know a lot of history about Islam. I come from a, a very briefly, I would like to kind of, you talked about everything happened in the North. I come from a rural, coastal part of Tamil Nadu, southmost uh, part of India. So I also come from a, a, a village as 100% Muslims. I always wondered about uh, how this came about. Do you have any insight into the spread of uh, Islam, Islamic traditions in other parts of India? Uh, because uh, this is something I always wondered about it. Uh, how how come? <laughs> so Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's there's... Richard Eaton has a great book called the, the Rise of Islam on the Bengal Frontier, which I recommend reading. Um, 
I, I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different theories about kind of why conversion to Islam happens at various points. Uh, there's some theories that you know kind of lower castes people uh, become Muslim because it's sort of a way of escaping that and entering into a more not egalitarian but a more egalitarian community. Of course, the irony is then that Muslims basically recreate the caste system internally within yeah. a, in Islam with things like Pak and Napak and things like that. Uh, what's very interesting is the, 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 the areas where you have the most in, intensive conversion or comprehensive conversion to Islam in the population in Bengal and the Punjab are outside the, the areas of the kind of Hindu caste to sort of, uh, you know, Brahminic tradition, right? So the areas that are within the sort of because you know like hindu brahmins in the, the 1500s or something if they would go to bengal they'd have to like purify themselves when they came back because this was it's like you went outside the, the borders of, the, of your world right so the places where there's the most intensive conversion to islam are the places that were not really within the hindu religious universe before uh, and I, I wonder, I don't know the answer about whether or not there's some elements in, in Tamil, Nadu, Tamil Nadu that are similar to that, but I don't, I don't know. But I would look at, um, at Richard Eaton's book on the rise of Islam in the, the Bengal frontier as a source. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Monolith Chatterjee, you're next. Unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I agree with, with strongly with Jonathan's issue about you know, the description of the role of Aurangzeb. Um, he is vilified, and he is vilified for a number of reasons uh, to do with, you know, I don't know, the killing of Guru Gobind and Shivaji's son and so on. But that was a time when India was not India. It was a series of, you know, the Mughal Empire was, had got too big. It couldn't be controlled centrally. He spent half, more than half his life trying to control other parts of the country and so on. And the narrative that we see is you could explain that narrative in more than one way. And the narrative, which is now becoming the definitive nationalist narrative, is this Hindu versus Muslim thing. But it's actually a regional conflict that was taking place at the time. There were Muslims in Shivaji's armies. There were Muslims in the Guru's armies. So it was not, it was not Muslim versus Sikh or Muslim versus Hindu. It was Punjabi versus the center. It was Maharashtrian versus the center. And the over-centralization of the country was Aurangzeb's great, great failure. And it paved directly paved the way for the coming of the British. And in particular, because the Mughal Raj had disintegrated to the point where when the British, when the Battle of Plassey took place, it was not Meet Jafar who betrayed Sirajutullah. It was the Mughal Emperor. This was a vassal of the Mughal Emperor fighting a foreign power. And the Mughal Emperor sent him no aid whatsoever. And Bengal was lost. And it was the richest part of the country at the time. So it was a regional conflict which has been going on for a long, long time. The one thing if anything that came good from the British rule, it was the idea that we as a people had to rise together. And that is indeed what happened during the great uprising in 1857. It was the first time that we actually rose together against it. Uh, common people, not some Maharajas and Sultans or any of that, common people, ordinary soldiers of all communities rose together against a foreign invader. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not Indian. Um, I really like South Asia. I mean, I, I, I know that's sort of a stupid thing to say, but I mean, I, I really, and I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I mean, I, I don't see how, you know, anytime, if you try to apply a really simplistic lens to such a complicated place, I can't see how that ends up leading to something good. I mean, you have to have a view that is going to be a little bit more permissive and flexible. Otherwise, I just don't know how this such a deep and broad universe can be managed. And you know, I, I would. What, what's really interesting is the the extent to which you know the the when the Europeans first, like the Portuguese first came and the British first came to into India in the you know the, the 1500s and stuff, and they 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 were they encountered these. Like some of the states in the Deccan had, and on and the good on the the coast of Malabar coast, they had like cannon making technology that was way better than the Portuguese. It's really interesting. They had the, they were exceptionally good arms makers. They um, and then even when you look at the the kind of the history of the British takeover of 
you know, kind of from roughly 1757 to around 1800, they were, you know, it was not, it was a really close call, right? I mean, if there had been one or just one or two decisions made differently by rulers, you know, of the great states of India in the 1700s, the East India Company would have been cast in, into the sea. And the, you know, the British had really unmatched fighting skills when they came, but then the, the different Indian states learned these from their French advisors and they were as the, they really gave the British army run for its money over and over again. And it was, you know, you know, it was like a close, close, close call, you know, one or two things had happened differently and it would have been a very different history. So I think but even I this, uh, yeah, go, sorry. So I said, but at no stage during that time between 1757 and 1800, did the various Indian rulers, bless them, rise together. So the British were yeah, able I to agree. fight they, in Bengal had... separately. Then they took Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan separately. At no point did these people communicate. The first time we did that, and we almost won in 1857, that was a very, very close call um, indeed, and could have gone either way. But that yeah, was I the first they, time we had something called a sense of a nation. Yeah, I think that's totally correct. I mean, it's if, you, if they had just been, um, like one or two slight differences in a alliance, you know, who was aligned with who in the 1770s or 80s, it would have been um, it would have been game over for the British in South Asia. All right. Thank you. That was the last question. Razi Bhai, back to you. Well, so I guess everybody is happy now with the questions and responses. Um, well, we don't have that many questions anymore. So can you, can you show me the uh, next slide? Uh, okay, just one second. So, well, thank you very much, Professor jo uh, Jonathan Brown, sir. Uh, it is a really very informative and very enlightening lecture. And I hope that most of our audience has learned a lot. Um, coming lecture is from Jamia Millia Islamia, Delhi. And Though we stand with this, but I'm not so sure about the speaker's health. Last night he called me that he is having high fever, and with the corona epidemic there, <laughs> I just wish him well and hope that he recovers and he doesn't have it. So he will be the next speaker. Uh, but in case he doesn't, then we will have some emergency speaker coming to our coming Saturday. <clears throat> 